Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and of course this is uh, Shackleton. This is my furry uh, sidekick. Last video, I talked about some of the latest state-of-the-art uh, climate system models that look at the, um, the evolution of sea ice area in the Arctic and try to come up with a... Uh, um, time frame as to when we can expect to lose uh, Arctic sea ice. And in this video, I'm going to expand on that topic, and I probably will. I have a number of, there's a number of really good sea ice uh, papers that have been published in the last few years, both on observation, so the satellite, uh, the passive microwave satellite data, which measures uh, sea ice concentration. You can get extent and area and then from the thickness with other satellites, you can get volume. So the observational data, um, but also the, the modeling, the various modeling data, you know, and they're both very, very important. Um, now, sea ice loss is, there's two main components of sea ice loss. There's a deterministic component, um, and both the models and the observations show that, um, there's a, there's a good correlation between global mean surface temperature rise and Arctic sea ice area or extent, uh, collectively known as Arctic sea ice coverage uh, loss. And of course, the global temperature rise depends on the CO2 levels, the cumulative CO2 levels, which um, so you can either look at the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, that dependence, or you can look at the um, cumulative CO2 emissions and look at it that way. So the net result is, um, from this paper I'm gonna show you by Knotts and Strove, is that based on a, if you take a baseline of 1880 to 1910, which is the baseline that most people use, remember to convert that to 1750 baseline uh, you need to add 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. But with that baseline that's commonly used, we're, we're over a degree Celsius uh, in warming now globally. And it's expected that about uh, 0.6 to 0.8 degrees Celsius uh, more rise in the global mean surface temperature, and there'll be essentially no sea ice left um, you can bring that down to a number of about 800 uh, gigatons or so um, of, of CO2. Now, at 40 gigatons a year, that, that would be translate to 20 years. But that's the deterministic component based on the forcings from greenhouse gases, which then cause a temperature change, which then causes the forcings in the Arctic. Now... One of the points is that they don't, the paper only refers to the connection to global mean surface temperature, whereas, you know, clearly I think, of course, the temperature in the Arctic is what's really key, and that depends on the temperature amplification effect, uh, which isn't discussed at all in the paper. So the correlation will probably be, will, you know, it has to be much better to the, to the Arctic temperature rise as opposed to the global mean temperature rise. So... Basically, you know, if you add the rise that's occurred now, 1.1 degrees Celsius or so, just over one, add 0.6 to 0.8, basically it shows that the, you know, we can expect seasonally ice-free Arctic, a seasonally ice-free Arctic Ocean um, before we reach a temperature rise of two degrees Celsius is one thing. And then you can convert that to cumulative CO2 emissions and you get that 800 gigatons number, but there is another component. It's not just the deterministic component. There's a very strong um, noise or uncertainty or internal variability because the climate system is, is uh, fundamentally chaotic. Okay, so there's an internal noise factor which works out to be about a million square kilometers or uh, 0.2 to 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. So if you take the under 2, you know, degrees Celsius and, and take the 
internal variability factor of up 0.2 to 0.4 Celsius, that brings you down to about 1.5, 1.6 degrees Celsius when we couldn't have, um, you know, a sea, when we could have the first blue ocean event, I call it, or, uh, you know, practical loss of all the Arctic sea ice. And then there'll be, there's huge ramifications from that. So, um, and that number of, that translates that 1 million square kilometers of climate very of, of the internal um, instability of the system, internal variability, if you like, um, that translates uh, to um, attempt, yeah, th th that basically ch translates to about a 300 uh, gigaton uncertainty. So instead of, um, you know, 800 gigatons for complete loss of Arctic sea ice in the summer, that would be, that would change it from to be in a range of about 500 uh, to uh, 1100 gigatons allowance left before we have, you know, 95% chance of losing sea ice in, you know, summers, then that um, at 40 gigatons per year, the lower end of that range, 500, could, that's 12 and a half years. The upper range um, from 1,100 gigatons divided by 40 gigatons gives you 27.5 years. So there's about a 15-year spread. Um, okay, so those are what all the numbers are saying. Now, you know, that assumes aerosols don't change that much, you know, and we know that over time aerosols should drop. And of course, with the virus, they've dropped significantly. So it's going to be some very interesting um, possible situations in the Arctic. We've already seen huge temperature anomalies over Siberia. So let me get into the paper now. Um, okay, so this is the paper, and this is open source. So you can just uh, Google the trajectory towards a seasonally ice-free Arctic Ocean, not some strobe and uh, get the PDF. Now, just to remind you, um, yes, this is my blog, paulbeckwith.net. Please consider donating to support uh, this work. And on Facebook, I, this, this was my video from yesterday, Arctic sea ice loss projections from the latest and greatest climate simulation models. And a couple of the main results from this uh, paper on the models and the simulation is one is it can give you the um, internal variability which is about a million square kilometers or that 300 plus or minus 300 gigatons of cumulative emissions left um, but it also gives you the sea ice loss um, the the slopes of the curves basically so the sea ice uh, loss is um, it is about three square meters per ton of CO2 emitted, and that's the loss in September's, or that translates to a loss of about four million square kilometer per degree Celsius rise in global mean surface temperature, um, and that's again for, for September. Those are some key findings from that work, and I also uh, sent it out in, in tweets. And one very, very fascinating thing, if you haven't seen this video, go to my Twitter at Paul H. Beckwith and have a look at the video of this uh, huge mudslide in Norway. And I might do a separate video on that. I mean, the ground was saturated, you know, and maybe permafrost in there had thawed, I don't know, and the whole thing slid off, carrying multiple houses into the ocean. You know, pretty, pretty incredible uh, video if you look at the beginning of it. You can see these houses, you know, what we take for granted as being solid earth, this whole thing slid off into the ocean. And I think this is probably worth a, a separate uh, video at some point. Okay, so let, let me uh, stop that. Okay, so this is the paper we're looking at, the trajectory towards a seasonally ice-free Arctic Ocean. Okay, and I've got it here also. Okay, so we're gonna have a look at this paper. It was published a few years ago. It's got excellent information. Um, so 
the observed, so we've clearly lost Arctic sea ice. So that raises the prospects of when will we have the first ice-free Arctic Ocean? And how long will it last? Will it just be a few weeks in September? And how long will it take to extend into other seasons? So how long before August, September, October are open, for example, no sea ice? Okay, so the findings of this paper, there's, uh, there, there's a deterministic component that arises from future greenhouse gas emissions or cumulative emissions in the future. And there's a chaotic component that arises from internal variability. The deterministic component is expected to cause a largely ice-free Arctic Ocean during the summer with less than two degrees Celsius of global warming relative to pre-industrial. And like I say, they define that as 1880 to 1910, but you need to add 0 0.3 degrees to that to get you back to the 1750, the original pre-industrial definition. To keep chances below 5% that the Arctic Ocean will largely be ice-free in a given year, the total future CO2 emissions must remain below 500 gigatons. And that's in the, so that's the 800 plus or minus 300, so that's 500 to 1100 range. This would be 12, reached in 12 and a half years. Okay, so of course, you know, changes in Arctic sea ice are huge. It's a very obvious effect of ongoing rapid change in the climate state of our planet. Over the past few decades, the sea ice covered ocean area of the Arctic Ocean has been reduced by about half. So the sea ice area or sea ice extent down by about half during summer, ice thickness also down by half, multiply area by thickness to get the volume. If these areas down a half, ice thickness is down a half, a half times a half is a quarter. So the volume of the Arctic summer sea ice cover is only roughly a quarter of what it used to be just a few decades ago. So it's dropped extremely quickly. And how long will it take for that last quarter to disappear? Okay, that's the big question because that's when the Arctic state completely changes. Okay, so this paper, uh, you know, they, it started looking at the main sources of information to estimate future evolution of the Arctic sea ice. So basically, there's models and there's observations. Both the models, computer models, the simulations, and the observations have both have strengths and weaknesses. But using the strengths of both, right, and, and uh, the, you know, looking at the strengths of both, you can, you can get rid of a number of the weaknesses. And basically, so that's how we measure it, or that's how we find out the state. But there, the forcings, the external forcings are, there, there's the response of the sea ice cover, it changes. It's, why is it decreasing? Because of external forcing, internal variability, and self-amplification. Okay, so all of those factors are, are looked at to try to figure out what's going on. So like in most science fields, there's two major sources of information to, to look at a particular parameter, like the loss of Arctic sea ice in the real world. What we observe and the models, but there's limitations to both of these. So let's have a look at more detail. So the observations, we have observational records of Arctic sea ice. That's the best, gives you the best possible estimate of the real evolution of the sea ice cover. But there's three limitations to this. The first limitation to the observations is internal variability. Climate systems chaotic. If you start with some external boundary condition, there's an infinite number of possible climate trajectories because of the noise. However, only one of these trajectories is actually realized and can be observed, the reality of what happened. Like, in other words, you know, you throw a dice and you see a one. It doesn't tell you anything about the range of outcomes or anything else, right? It's just one sampling of what's possible. Same thing with the sea ice. The observations are one sampling of these possible climate trajectories. Um, so, you know, and the record of a climate observable, so you, so then you get limited insights into the relative impact of external forcing or internal variability on the time evolution of that observable, okay? So, and we only have a 30 year record. It's not really long enough to give a meaningful average climate condition, if you like. Okay, another limitation is the observational uncertainty, and I'll continue this in another video. Thanks for listening.